Greetings, salutations, all that good shit. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon. I'm Reverend Rick, but you already know that. You're here on a Sunday morning on the internet with me for some damn reason. My mic is a little quiet. How's that? Thank you, Bill. How is that? Does that, does that... Am I coming through loud enough for y'all? Do I need to get louder? Tad Mort. All right. Much better. How is that? Am I coming through loud enough now? There we go. All right. Thank you, Bale and Zale. Welcome. To this Sunday morning, I hope everyone has had a wonderful week. I'm moving a little slow, as I may or may not have been at an amazing show last night. If you get the chance to see all them witches, take that chance, homies. Take that chance. Take that ride. Take the pill. Whatever you gotta do, it's worth it. I figured out what they're pulling over on everybody. They're just the heaviest jam band I've ever seen. And, and I like that shit. I like it a lot. <laughs> You're of the loud is more good opinion. Yeah, that's why we're friends. Because <laughs> I am also of that opinion. But greetings and welcome. I'm glad everyone could be here. For those that are watching on the VOD later, we love you too. So let's get to the things at hand that we have to talk about. You know, we're going to induct a heretic this week. You guys know this. This is how we work, right? We're a well-oiled machine. We, we move right along. And then we'll do the main part of the message. Today's message is going to be spicy. If it had a spice level, it would be like 4 million Scoville. I'm even going to mildly break. I mean, who the fuck am I kidding? It's not mildly. It's not mild at all. We're going to break one of our rules today. One of our rules is generally don't be mean. Don't be, you know, dismissive of people's beliefs. Yeah, fuck that shit today. We're going to get real, real mean and real, real dismissive of stupidity in the second half of today's sermon. If you are a Mormon or friends with people of such beliefs, sorry, I, I guess, I'm, I'm not sorry, but I'll apologize as I was told you should make fake apologies to people. You should have invited them, because I have, I have things to say. We all know that you know religion is bupkis. This, this is, this is, we know this. But man, that one, the fuck are they talking about? Like, all you gotta keep asking yourself whenever you study the Mormon faith, you have to ask yourself one question. And you should ask yourself this question a lot. And that question is, how the fuck do they not get that this is a grift? L. Ron Hubbard got nothing on the Mormons. Everybody's like, oh, he made up science. Motherfucker, these, these dudes made it up. And, and as we will discuss, they were making shit up, flying from the hip the whole time. You have an ex-Mormon friend. Well, they're probably the smarter friend. <laughs> well, let's do our thing. Thank you for being here. I, I truly do appreciate it. You could be anywhere else in the world. You could still be in bed. You could be smoking crack. Maybe you are smoking crack, but you're here. And that that's, that's, that's what matters to me. So thank you for being here. Let us dive in. You know where we're headed, homies. 
we're headed to the Hall of Heretic Heroes. Because it's time to get our induction on. So, as we should recap a little bit, who, who, who is in the hall? You know our hall. Got our homie Giordano Bruno. William of Ockham. He's just asking questions. Our boy Minocchio. Anne Askew. Michael Cervantes. And of course, Henry the Monk. We loved him. This week, who? Who could be worthy of joining them, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because I'm fixing to tell you. That's John Badby, motherfuckers. The fact that there are only pictures of this gay on fire. It should tell you how amazing he is. This is literally the only pictures you can find of this guy are with him on fire. Oh, John Badby's a bad boy. This motherfucker. If not giving a fuck was an Olympic event, this guy would have gold medals stacked to the ceiling. He didn't fucking care. I also love that the pictures of him. Look look at that picture. Drink it in, right? He looks like a very old man. Dude was 30 when he died. So I, I, I don't I don't really get that. But yeah, he didn't believe in magic, and he told off the King of England. Yeah, I love this guy. I, I, he told the King of England to get fucked, and, you know, that Harry Potter wasn't real. This guy's awesome. Buckle up, kids. <laughs> so, again, the only pictures that survive of this guy are pictures of his execution, because... Well, yeah, you know, you do something really well. They don't talk about the other shit you did. He's our first 13th and 14th century, you know, 14th and 15th century heretic. Most of our heretics have come from the 16th century because, well, that was just when there was the hotbed of heresy. What do you want me to do? Of course, William of Ockham came from the 12th century. He was an OG heretic. But I digress. He was a commoner. So, most reports lead us to believe that John Badby was a tailor, but he could have possibly been a back blacksmith. But we know that he was a working class guy who had his skill. He was, you know, a skilled worker. And he didn't give a fuck what the church or the monarchy had to say. He was doing his thing. He was making his shit. And he was not going to be told nothing by nobody. Well, it's not that there's less heresy. It's that the church realized it just couldn't go around burning everybody who said shit it didn't like. That That's really where we're at. There's probably more heresy now than there's ever been if you want to go with the, you know, technical definition of heresy. But... The church no longer can burn people for it. So they try to... It's amazing. The church is far less concerned about heresy when they can't light you on fire for it. When they can light you on fire, well, then everything's heresy. But then, when they can't do shit about it, they they seem to care less. That That's, you know... I feel like that that is the church in a nutshell right there. The more power you give them, the more they'll abuse. So if you just strip away all their powers and make them a non-functional little charity, they'd probably get their shit together. Just just saying. You know, for all the politicians who aren't listening to me. His story cannot be properly told without understanding the political climate of the times. Because as with many of our heretics... It, it, it's this is about more than John Badby's beliefs. We will get into this in a minute, but but I just want you to understand that this guy's story. Yeah, if you give a church some power, it's like if you give a mouse some cheese, right? It's the same story. <laughs> yeah, John Badby was a pawn in a game way bigger than him. And I can't overstate that. Because everything he did 
was not super uncommon at the time. They just decided that when he did it, it was a fucking problem. But as you will see, they really tried to not have to make it end like it did because of the time and that shit wasn't like this back then. Again, as we've talked about, it was the 15th century and this, then really into the 16th century where they just the church just started lighting up everybody. You looked at the church wrong. You got lit on fire. At this point, way back in, it wasn't common to just burn people, especially lay people. But John Badby had the worst luck ever. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. This guy's dedication to what he believed is nothing short of insane. This guy, we, we've, as you've seen, I believe you've seen, with our, our earlier heretics, they generally got a chance to recant and didn't. John Badby gets a bunch of chances to recant at some really interesting points in his story. Doesn't care. Not this guy. He's not recanting one bit. So what was the nature of his heresy? He was an early adopter of the Lollard beliefs, and he never set out to become a heretic. He was more of a wrong place, wrong time kind of guy. Now, the Lollards, as I hope you know, but if you don't, we'll enlighten you, they were the precursors to the Protestants. The Great Reformation had not happened yet, but there was already cracks in the foundation of the church. And the Lollards... They were the wedge that was being driven into that crack. John Wyclef. We all we know him. We, we've talked about Wyclef John a bunch. He was kind of the guy that set the tone. And the Lollards are the people that were like, Hey, what that guy's selling, I'm buying. That's where our boy John Badby comes in. He he, he, he he, heard what John Wyclef John was saying. He's like, you know what? This makes sense to me. This checks out. I'm in. That was about it. He didn't go around preaching. He didn't go around spreading his beliefs like Johnny, like some kind of, you know, theological Johnny Appleseed. No, no, no. <laughs> More like LOL, Lord, am I right? Well played, Sal. Well fucking played. Yeah, he felt that the Bible was the basis for all Christian belief. And that if it's not in the Bible, why are we doing it? And if you've been awake for any of the sermons, you realize that following the Bible is the last fucking thing the Catholic Church is into. They made up a whole bunch of shit to make money off it, damn it, you're not going to tell them that they can't do this made-up shit just because it's not in the Bible. That, that, that was the real spicy take that John Badby had. It was like, hey, why are we doing this? It's not in the book. That, 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 was, that was it. It is still very unclear what put him on the church's radar? Because, again, as I said, he was a, a commoner. He was not a preacher. He didn't go about proselytizing. He wasn't trying to convert people to his way of thinking. So, we're not really sure why the church singled this guy out and was like, you, you're the fucking problem. But it was effective but we're, we're not really sure why it was even effective. Like, we don't have records that this guy was out trying to convert masses of people. Anything like that. We're not really sure why the church gave a shit 
what this one tailor or blacksmith thought, but gave a shit they did. And, yeah, once his trial began, it wasn't as much about the heresy. It was more about the fact that the king, who was vying to prove that he was head of the church, not the pope, had told him to recant. And he said, no. <laughs> Chris, you're not wrong at all. Welcome in. This is why we don't let people read. <laughs> yep. They go reading the Bible. They start getting funny ideas that maybe we should just stick to the shit that's in the Bible. If you don't let them read the Bible, you can tell them all kind of nonsense is in there. And that wraps up the notes of the first Catholic Church meeting. So what did he do that really made the Catholics mad? Well, he rejected that the clergy had the power to perform transubstantiation. One of his famous quotes is that if the priests really have the power to turn bread and wine into Christ, then there must be 20,000 gods in England, and he only believed in one. This guy didn't give a fuck. And I think that's really important, that you realize how little fucks John Badby give. But that that is literally it. This is the spicy shit that made them so mad at this guy. Was that he was like, your priests are impotent. They don't have the power to turn bread and wine into the body of Jesus. It's just a symbolic act. Stop pretending they have magic powers. And the church was like, fuck you, they have magic powers. We will burn your ass. And he said, what does that have to do with anything? Probably. He was summoned to St. Paul's Cathedral to stand trial in front of the Archbishop and ordered to repent. He said no. Then the king showed up. This is how bananas this is. This guy is just a, he's a nobody. And he wasn't marching about preaching. He wasn't converting masses. This was not Henry the monk with his fucking hype man coming into town disrupting all the shit. This was a lowly tailor or blacksmith who apparently told some friends that he thought some things that were out of the mainstream. And the entire church and the fucking government stopped what they were doing to deal with this guy. It's fucking weird. This was during the defund the church movement. And it was gaining steam. The church did not enjoy the defund the church movement. Not at all. Somebody had to take the fall for it. And it looks like it was John Badby. Despite the fact that he wasn't really, that we know of, a part of the defund the church movement at all. We should explain that. So, at the time, the church was given an official entitlement from the government anybody who was a priest any church all of that they got money from the crown every year to help operate the church somebody pulled the king aside and was like do you have any idea how much money you're spending on them and apparently they showed him the books and said this is how much you give the church let me show you what you could do with that money if you weren't giving it to the church. And it basically was pointed out to the king that if he stopped funding the church, told the church to fund their own shit, that he could raise five more lords and 20,000 more troops and hundreds and hundreds of more knights and he could build more castles just there was a whole bunch of shit that he could do with the exorbitant amount of money that he was giving to the church. Somebody pointed that out to him. And he was like, well, wait, yeah. Why, why am I giving all this money to the church when I could be, you know, buying cool stuff with it? The church was like, excuse me, cutting our funding, you say? Right. 
All that money goes in the silly hat budget. The church did not like these overtures. The church was very, very upset that this was even being discussed. So they had to make it a point to prove that shit could go haywire at any minute if you didn't have the church. And the church decided that they had to prove to Henry how fucking important they were. And that they were the ones keeping him in power. And so, what did they do? They dragged up this poor guy, John Badby, and claimed that by his refusal to recant, that he was fomenting insurrection. And that if you didn't get him under your thumb quick enough, it was going to lead to a whole bunch of other people doing whatever they want. And you can't have that. So, again, I, I feel like that's an important context to this story. This John Badby was not that much more of a heretic than anybody else at the time. There were lots of people that were questioning transubstantiation, questioning the role of the church. Up until this point, if you weren't actually a preacher going about preaching this stuff, you didn't. the church didn't care. Some random guy who tells his neighbor, hey, you know, I think the church might be full of shit. They weren't really concerned with that. But with John Badby, they decided to be concerned with it, and they made it about this defund the church movement. They made it about, well, yeah, if you don't have us, then the people are going to start asking all kinds of crazy questions, and eventually they're just going to stop following the king because they only follow the king because he's empowered by God. That was what the church was selling. And that if they won't recant when you tell them, what else won't they do when you tell them? That that was kind of where they went with that. One of the greatest lines of all time. During his trial, he was told that he would be killed if he did not repent. He looked right at them and he said, Toads and snails are more worthy of worship than bread and wine. For at least the good Lord made the toad and the snail. Legend. Fucking legend. They're telling this guy, we're going to kill you if you don't recant. And he fires back, yeah, good for you. Because, you know, I'm not, I, bread and wine do not get worshipped. They're, they're, no, they're actually beneath toads and snails. I mean... <laughs> the toad lord yeah they took that about as well as you think they did but that's fucking baller that's that right there like that is is in the transcript from his trial that's fucking great because he had to know how they were going to respond to that statement he made it anyway he didn't fucking care love this guy so how'd that work out for him? Yeah, I think you know how this worked out for him. He was condemned to be burned for heresy. And the location that they took him to to burn him was symbolic as well because it was the site of just, you know, a few years earlier, the Peasant Rebellion. So, yeah, again, this was not about him. This was not nearly as much about him as this was about keeping people in their place. And the church had solidified itself as, you know, kind of the right-hand man to the king. So if you got a guy that won't recant when the king tells him to, the church was able to spin that into, well, what else won't they do? You, you better snuff this out. you got a rebellion brewing on your hands. Which, there's absolutely no indication that there was any rebellion brewing whatsoever. There was more of the king was trying to get a better return on his investment and thought that maybe soldiers and warriors and tax-paying lords might be more valuable to him than guys in silly hats. The guys in silly hats responded. The crown prince, Henry's son, 
He showed up at the burning. And again, before they burned him, told him, just repent. I will order these men to let you go. They're not, they're not wanting to burn John, John Badby, but he really won't fucking cooperate. He just refuses to cooperate. Love this guy. He's like, no, I'm not. I, I'm not taking back anything I said. So he was placed in a barrel, and that barrel was placed atop bundles of sticks, and they declared this man is an unrepentant heretic. He has to suffer the consequences. Checks out. The sticks were lit, and he was quickly engulfed in the flames. He began screaming, because being lit on fire sucks. The prince heard him screaming, saw the flames consuming this man, and the prince said, pull the the sticks away. Pull the flames away from him. So they did. And he was so hot they couldn't touch him. But they got the barrel down. John Badby is burned. It's not a good sight. It had the smell off. And the prince came up to him. And knelt beside this burnt man. And begged him to recant. He offered him a pension of three pence a day for the rest of his life. If he would just recant. Told him they would get a medical treatment and he would pay him for the rest of his life. Just recant. John told the prince exactly where he could put that pension. So they put him back in the barrel and they burned him to ashes. And the defund the church movement, yeah, it never it didn't go anywhere after this. After this event, nobody mentioned defunding the church again. And, again, there's no evidence whatsoever that John Badby gave a blue shit about defunding the church. There's zero evidence that he was involved in that in any way, shape, or form. But, it didn't matter because they used him as a commoner they used him as, you know, the bargaining chip. Said, hey, this guy believes this. What else do they believe? They're clearly not afraid of you, King. And so they burned him. Nobody talked about defunding the church anymore. So, I guess. <laughs> oh, do we have somebody fun in here? Oh, he's, somebody was trying to sell us. We were going to be famous. Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, I want to be famous. Did you tell the king to go fuck himself and get yourself lit and on fire? Because if you didn't, then do you really want to be famous? Do you really want it? <laughs> yeah, Grizz. I'm with you 100%. I think it's impressive that, like, he actually saw the guy getting burned and was like, wait, this is terrible. Seriously, we don't want to do this. Just please say what we want you to say. And this badly burned man was like, go fuck yourself. Finish me off. I'm not saying shit. Because let's be honest. Under most circumstances... They could have just said he recanted, right? History's written by the victors, all that shit. But this guy, (laughs) he was enough of a sensation at this point that they just had to pretend that they, they were giving him a way out. They wanted him to take that way out so bad. And it is actually known that John Badby... One of his little firsts. He was the first non-clergy burned at the stake in England. To that point, if you were not going out and actively preaching heresy, the church left you be. That is one of the things that makes his story so interesting is that he wasn't out there preaching and spreading his heresy. 
He was just a guy who didn't agree with them. And they took him and burned him because it was politically convenient. And so that's why we stand this guy is he just, you know, wrong place, wrong time. He wasn't a preacher. He had nothing to gain from this. It would have been very easy for him to just recant, to just say, whatever you want me to say, I, I don't really want to get lit on fire. He could have done any number of things, but he did not. He stayed the course, got burned for it, but went out like a fucking legend. Talking about toads and snails and telling everyone to kiss his ass. John Badby, we like that guy. So, we've come to this part of the sermon. And while I don't normally do trigger warnings and all that shit, we are going to again warn you. I'm not going to be nice. What the things I'm about to talk about irritate the blue fuck out of me. The Book of Mormon. And the Mormon religion are a fucking grift. It may be well-intentioned. I, I, I don't know. I don't care. If you don't see this as a grift, you're stupid. There, there, there's no other way around. I made this shit up. And it's really obvious that they made this shit up. And they got a whole state. They literally have an entire state. They run Utah. They got two senators in their pocket. The Mormon church has two senators in their pocket. No other church can brag that. It's fucked up. These people are a cult. They may be a well-intentioned cult, but they're a cult. And I say that they do have their own NCAA football team. They do. And I say that with the knowledge that I don't know how many Mormons any of you know. I've been to Utah multiple times. I, I do. I know Mormons. They are generally, and we are speaking in generalities here, they are generally very kind people. They are big on family. They are big on loving the poor, helping the sick. Mormons as a whole, are not bad people. That's not what I'm going at here. But you can be a good person and still believe a lot of stupid bullshit. And the Mormons, they've got that on lockdown. You think Christianity has some nonsense? You think Judaism has some nonsense? Motherfucker, you have no idea the nonsense that these people believe. And what's really appalling about it, in true cult form, is that as times have changed, and their abhorrent views have really fallen out of fashion and become indefensible, they just kind of move the goalposts. And they say, oh, well... Yeah, that's our teaching, but we don't actually go in for all that. We don't really believe that. And you're like, well, but that's your teaching. So does that, no, it doesn't invalidate all the other teaching. We just, we don't, we don't do that anymore. That super racist, awful thing, we don't do that anymore. But we still believe the other stuff. So, uh, they don't pretend to be rooted in reality. And yet people still sign up for this shit. I don't get it. Fun little story before we launch into the sermon. There is a very interesting documentary. I believe, yeah, it's on Netflix. And it is about how this guy, who was a document forging specialist, made a document that looked to be a letter written by Joseph Smith, the guy who made up Mormonism, purported to this letter to be written by his wife talking about how he actually came up with the idea for the Book of Mormon when he talked to a giant white salamander. 
this guy made up this letter, and the Mormon church was ready to pay huge amounts of money for it. Because the Mormon church will pay shitloads of money for any documents that are connected to the beginnings of their church. Why? Because they're trying to control the narrative. They realize that Mormonism is a very recent thing. It's not like the Bible where you can be like, all the guys who, you know, kind of came up with this religion, this was thousands of years ago. We don't, you know, hundreds of years ago. We, we don't have any of those documents. The Mormon church, they made this shit up yesterday. So anytime a document surfaces that might be from those people, the Mormon church will shell out big bucks to try to get their hands on the document. Or if they can't get their hands on it, then they try to discredit it. But first, they just try to buy it. And so this guy made up a fucking document that said Joseph Smith actually came up with the Book of Mormon talking to magical giant lizards. And the Mormon church was like, buy that, because we can't have that getting out there. And then eventually this guy blew people up with a car bombs to cover up the nonsense that he was doing. It's a fascinating documentary. And, but you should totally watch it because it, it it goes right into what we're talking about. They made this shit up, and they know they made this shit up. The Mormons are a cult. There's no other way to look at it. I, I'll not hear of any other way to look at it. It's a fucking cult. They might be a well-intentioned cult. They might be nice people. I don't fucking care. It's a cult. This is every bit as much of a cult as Scientology is. Yet, we all give Scientology infinite shit as being a joke religion that's clearly not real and just a way for a pedophile to make money to buy bigger yachts to put more little boys on with them. But yet, the Mormon church it is just as much of a cult. But somehow, they get a pass. I, I don't get it. I don't like it. Let's dive in, fuckers. So we're going to talk about the Book of Moron. Nah, it's not a typo. Fuck them. Fuck them. Look at this swarmy bastard. That is Joseph Smith. Giant dickhead. Made this whole thing up. But he didn't even make it up himself because he's just not that cool. This guy sucks. Look at him. Look at him. He's got a Franklin Pierce look about him. Everybody knows how much that guy sucked. Smith became interested in religion around age 12. He and other members of his family, they practiced religious folk magic. Yeah, stupid bullshit. His family were religious folk magic practitioners. Think of the dumbest parts of Harry Potter and then have it not work at all. That was Joseph Smith's family. These people sucked from minute one. They were in dire financial straits. Their main source of income being religious treasure hunters. I shit you not. That is where his family made their living, was convincing people to finance them to go wander about in the woods and pray under the auspice that they would find religious relics in the United States. You know, where Jesus never was. Let it sink in. Are, are, are you smelling a grift yet? Do you smell the bullshit? Poor guy whose family does folk magic and are religious treasure hunters comes up with a way to not be poor anymore. He had his first vision at 15. Then he had another one at 18. And then after four years of searching, he found the magic gold plates that no one who's ever been connected to this con ever saw. Mormons will lo love to point out that there is an affidavit signed by three men outside of Joseph Smith who all claim we totally saw the gold plates and the Urim and Thummim that he used to translate them. You remember those? Call back. You love it. Yeah. Um, 
they all also happen to be Joseph Smith's homies who were instrumental in him developing the church. So, the only people that ever saw the plates were people who had a vested interest in making sure that everybody believed that these gold plates ever existed at all. That's not evidence. Mormons will tell you that it is. I assure you, it is not. So the angel Morani. I didn't even have to fuck with that one. If you don't remember him from any of our stories, it's because he wasn't there. There is no Angel Morani. This asshole made it up. Just saying. In 1827, Smith became infatuated with a woman named Emma Hale. Not far from where I'm sitting right now. In Harmony, Pennsylvania. Been there many times. Her father refused to accept Smith's proposal of marriage. Because Smith was a loser. He, he flat out said it. He said, you have no means of supporting my daughter... You are insubordinate, and you, you kind of look like shit. He said, you look disheveled. What the fuck? No, you cannot marry my daughter. Well, if you know anything about Mormons, not marrying daughters is not something they're into. So, they eloped and went back up to the western New York area with Smith's parents. It doesn't get better. He promised to get a real job. He told Hale's mother, Hale's family, that he would totally get out of the religious treasure finding business and actually get a real job. So they said, okay, we'll help get you set up in, you know, a real job. So they went back to her family's house. Magically, that's where the gold plates were. All this time. He, he found them. Right after he said, I'm going to get a real job, I'm going to, you know, stop this religious treasure hunting bullshit, what happens? The ultimate religious treasure hunt find. He finds the golden plates written by the angel Moroni. No one found that suspect, apparently. No one found that questionable. He claimed that the plates were written in Reformed Egyptian. If you don't know what that is, congratulations. Neither does anyone else, because he fucking made it up. And he also found a Urim and a Thummim to help him translate the plates. Again, he did not find these things. He's a liar. But, yeah. Right when he needed to find them. Right when his wife had said, enough of this, get a real job. He's like, oh, I was totally on my way to get a real job. And I found these magical golden plates written in this language that doesn't exist. Yeah, definitely not Coptic. No, not at all. The, again, as I stated earlier, the only people who ever saw the plates were also the people who actually wrote the Book of Mormon. What riff, you say? I thought Joseph Smith wrote it. No. Mormons love to point out that Smith could not have made this up as he was too stupid to do so. That is an official LDS talking point. Is There is a letter from Joseph Smith's wife when somebody at the back in the day was like, you, you know your husband made this shit up, right? And his wife's response was that he is too stupid to have made this up. That he was not creative, not intelligent enough, to have made this up and likely she was telling the truth see his friends were all businessmen wealthy people who realized they had a full-blown top-notch con on their hands they weren't about to let that go by the wayside so it's likely that those guys actually wrote the book of mormon and just let joseph smith play leader because hey Every religion needs a prophet. You, you need a guy. He was their guy. But yeah, that's their official talking point, was he was too stupid to have made this up. Not a good look. Those three co-conspirators, they signed the affidavit that they totally saw the plates. Where are the golden plates, you ask? 
the angel took them back to heaven after they were done translating them. That's why the church doesn't have them today. They were totally real. And, and four people totally saw them. But the angel took them back when they were done. Again. Like. Yeah, they're on loan. You can't have the golden plates. I was just letting you look at them for a little while. Like, again. How do you not smell the con here? Those three men, they started having visions from God too. But then Joseph Smith, he had a vision that stated he was the only one that could have visions. And that any church rules had to come from him. He then told those three guys, oh, by the way, God said you should totally go convert all the Native Americans. Which was kind of a dangerous job at the time. It was, I mean, just flat out. It was, oh, you guys are having visions too? Actually, I had one that says you can't have visions. And by the way, head out into the Wild West and convert us some Native Americans. Seriously. Again, to anyone with half a fucking brain, this reeks of insanity. Local thought Smith was a whack job who was creating a cult and they ran him and the morons that were following him out of town. Magically, this happened right around the time that Smith totally had a vision that God wanted him to go west. Wasn't that he got run out of town, he was leaving anyway. I, I, I just can't with this guy. This continued on where they moved to a town, pissed people off, moved further west. Until eventually, a newspaper wrote some mean things about him. Joseph Smith ordered his followers to go burn the printing press. They did. The locals responded by shooting John Smith. He apparently thought that, you know... Writing mean things about him in a newspaper totally meant that it was okay to burn the newspaper office to the ground. And he was stunned that, you know, the locals, they did not appreciate that to the point that they lynched him. Fuck John Smith. So, let's launch in to some of the ridiculous shit that Mormons believe. This is by no means an all-encompassing list of all the insane things Mormons believe. This is just dipping our toe in the pool. But I do want to dispel at least a couple myths about Mormons. Mormons do not believe... That, you, you will hear often that Mormon missionaries are not allowed to swim. And people will say it's because they believe the devil controls all bodies of water. And while Joseph Smith did write some insane shit about the devil controlling bottles of bodies of water, the reason Mormon missionaries are not allowed to swim is just simply a liability thing. If you go swimming, there's a chance you could drown. That's really all there is. That's why they also don't play basketball. It's not that the Book of Mormon forbids playing basketball. They just don't want their missionaries doing anything that they could end up injured. Because a lot of times they're in, you know, places where medical care is not as shitty as it is here. And they don't want them to maybe find out that medical care is better in other countries. Even countries that are supposedly third world. But I digress. That's for a different sermon. So, they believe... Let's, let's start off with Jesus and the Native Americans. There's no way to make this not sound insane. So, According to Joe Smith, a family of Israelites moved to North America in 600 BCE. Despite that being fucking impossible. Yes, apparently, some Israelites got on a trireme and somehow got their way all the way across the ocean to North America. 
long before Leif Erikson, 1,400 years, or actually, when was that? Would be like 1,600 years before Leif Erikson made it to the Americas. These Israelites totally got there. That, that checks out, probably. Mormons believe that after his, that these, the descendants of these Israelites that rode their boat over to fucking North America in 600 BCE, that there were kind of two versions, two, two branches, the Nephites and the Lamanites, named after Nephi, who they made up, and Laman, who was one of uh, Abraham's sons. And that these were actually the precursors to Native Americans. No walking across the Bering Strait. None of that. No, no, no. Not, despite the fact that Native Americans in 600 BCE had a thriving population of multiple tribes across the country. No, no, no. They are descendants from Israel because this maniac said so. The Lamanites, they were bad. So they were cursed with dark skin so that they would be unattractive to the Nephites. Yep, yeah, unpack that. They believe that the curse of Cain or the curse of Ham. Now, I love Ham. But there's a story in the Bible it makes zero fucking sense. Where Abraham, he gets hammered. And apparently he's naked in his tent while he's drunk. His son Ham walks in and sees him naked. And because of that, God curses him. It If that makes no fucking sense to you, congratulations, you, you're not an idiot. Because, yeah, that's what they came up with. But, yeah. So... The, Na the Nephites, they were light-skinned. The Lamanites, they were dark-skinned. Because dark skin equals bad in the Mormon church. Congratulations, you fucking racist. For 84 years after Christ's appearance, the Lamanites and the Nephites get along. But then, the Lamanites, they started going back to not, you know, worshipping God. They're, oh, they're not trying to hide it, Bale. There, there's no hiding it. The Lamanites killed all the Nephites. And that's why Native Americans, as we know them, are darker skinned. It's because they're all descendants from the Lamanites who killed all the Nephites. Historical record be damned, this is what happened. Because some asshole said so. Yeah, again, the mark of Cain in the Bible, when they talk about Cain killed Abel, we know the story, and that God put a mark on him afterwards. There is nothing in the Bible that says that that mark is dark skin. But the Mormons, they jump right into that. That the curse of Cain, the curse of Ham, that it was dark skin. And so dark skin means you're bad. You will hear people sometimes accuse the Mormons of saying that all black people are descended from the devil. That's not actually accurate. But dark skin equals bad? Yeah, that that's that's Mormon teaching. And if you've ever seen Mormons, you've realized how lily white they tend to be. So Joe Smith tasked his followers with converting as many natives as they could so that they become white. Yes, that's what I said. They believed that if the people converted to Mormonism, they would turn white. If not in this life, then when they got to heaven, they would be white. If that's the most racist shit you've ever heard, congratulations. You, you're, you're paying attention. They also used this to justify participating in the slave trade with the Native Americans. Mormons bought huge numbers of Native children to convert them. 
So much so that they literally destabilized the Native American economy because the Mormons began paying such huge sums to get as many children as they could that the tribes began warring against each other for the express purpose of kidnapping children from the other tribe to sell to the Mormons. The Mormons would then work them like slaves, but totally try and convert them, which made everything else okay. Because, see, the Mormon position on slavery is whatever is politically convenient at the time. The Mormons helped make Missouri a slave state. But then, when they went to Kansas, which was a non-slave state, they were totally against slavery. Then when they got to Utah, they were totally into slavery again, until it had become unfashionable, and then they were totally not into slavery anymore. They were political opportunists, which you may also notice as not being a real fucking religion. They would not engage with the Mexicans in the slave trade, though. Because. I got nothing. I, I, I don't know why. When the Mormons tried to stop the Mexicans from trading with the Indians, the Mexicans responded by slaughtering children in front of the Mormons. There is a story of a Mexican slave trader telling the Mormons, if you don't want me selling these children to the Indians or buying children from the Indians, you should buy the children. And the Mormons said, no, we don't deal with people like you. He grabbed one of the children by their ankles and bashed the child's skull off a rock and said, see, wouldn't it have been better if you'd have bought him? To which the Mormons responded, it's still better that he's dead than to have been raised as a savage. Because seriously, fuck these people. Holy underwear. You had to have heard of it. I can't be the first one to tell you about holy underwear. But yes, the Mormons believe in holy underwear. They're called temple garments. And they are a special set of undergarments given to the Mormons when they complete their endowment ceremony and it grants them access to the temple. You're not supposed to go in the temple unless you are wearing these amazing things pictured here. They're supposed to wear them day and night. And the Mormon church teaches that they actually offer physical protection as well as spiritual. Other than protecting you from ever getting laid, I don't know what those protect you from. But that's, that's not for me to say. Modern Mormons state that the garments are symbolic and just serve to remind them of their faith. But they really don't like it when you call them magical or holy underwear. Well, then stop being a weirdo in a cult. And I'll stop making fun of the shit you do when you stop doing weirdo cult shit. Like wearing magic fucking underwear. There's a lot of shit in Christianity that's weird. There's not magic fucking underwear. The Mormons, they've got a multiverse. Oh, they've got a multiverse. Mormons believe that God created multiple universes with people living in each one. Each universe has its own, its own God. You only need to worry, though, about the one who rules the universe that you reside in. And if you do a really good job of it, you too can become a God. Yeah, it, it's that simple. You don't like being called a weirdo? Don't be a weirdo. Stop with the nonsense, and I won't have to make fun of you. But yeah, Mormons, there's a billion universes with a billion gods ruling each one. Lucky for us, we only have to worry about the one that's ruling the universe that we exist in. Because it could get exhausting to try to please all of them. This is right from the Book of Mormon. We are not the only people that the Lord has created. We have brothers and sisters on other earths. They look like us because they, too, are the children of God and were created in his image. For they also are his offspring. And the great universe of stars has multiplied beyond the comprehension of men. It hasn't. We know how many things there are. There's a lot, but we have numbers. We can count. 
Evidently, each of these great systems is governed by divine law, with divine presiding gods, for it would be unreasonable to assume that each was not so governed. You got that? Why do there have to be a billion universes with a billion gods running these a billion universes with people inhabiting these billions of universes? Why? Because it would be unreasonable to assume that there wasn't. Drink that in, kids. It's the dumbest thing you've ever heard. Mormons have three heavens. One, two, three. Three heavens. The celestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, and the telestial kingdom. Because let's be honest, white people love social stratification. If you can't convince people that they can have something better than someone else, what's the point of having anything? And the Mormons, they have realized that white people love to be part of exclusive clubs. This is rooted in their disbelief in the Trinity. Mormons, do, they believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but they believe them to be separate entities. They are not, you know, three gods in one. Mormons aren't buying that. It might be the only non-insane thing they believe. And they have an interesting interpretation of some shit that the Apostle Paul said to get to these three heavens. The Apostle Paul describes heaven in a couple different ways in his letters. The Mormons were like, no, he's totally talking about three different places. Why? Because how do you keep people under your thumb, but then better than telling them not only is there heaven, and you got to stick with us to get to heaven, but then you got to be really good in our religion to get to the third heaven. It, it, it's a fucking grift. Each step down gets less glorious than the previous. Because getting into heaven isn't good enough. you got to get to the good one. Nobody just wants to go to heaven. you got to go to the cool heaven. You can't just go to heaven. Everybody gets into heaven in the Mormon belief. They have spirit prison. Yeah, I said that. They have spirit prison. That's like their version of hell. And you go there when you die for a thousand years while Jesus reigns on earth. Then you get let out of there and you go to crappy heaven but it's still awesome they totally want you to know that which makes one wonder why would you become a mormon when you could just do whatever you wanted and not have to go to crappy heaven are you you're gonna get into crappy heaven anyway i got questions mormons don't have answers it's a celestial heaven and yes if you're looking at that picture there they have rooms in Mormon temples called celestial rooms. And they're supposed to mimic what celestial heaven would be like. Celestial heaven kind of seems like if Martha Stewart could somehow get even whiter, that is, she would decorate these rooms for you. Celestial heaven is reserved for people who follow the church's teachings to the letter, and they die in good standing with the Mormon church meaning they leave at least 10% of their estate to the Mormon church. That is a really key part of this. All children who die before the age of eight automatically go to celestial heaven. So apparently, you're eight, nine years old, fuck you. You're old enough to know better. Does that make sense? No. No, it does not. Has anything these people said made sense? No. No, it is not. This is the only heaven where you can do the nasty. And you can have babies in heaven. Why? Where do they get this from? I have no idea. But yeah, if you go to celestial heaven, you can bang your celestial heaven wife, and she can get knocked up, and you can have celestial babies in heaven. Because, of course you can. Why wouldn't you? I mean, what am I supposed to do with this? This is the weirdest shit I've ever heard of. Then there's terrestrial heaven. 
What's up, bud? What are you talking about? Crazy people. Crazy people about what? I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. This heaven is for people who have accepted the church's teachings, but were not valiant in the faith. Yeah, that means what you think it means. If you didn't go around driving people nuts, trying to convert them, and acting like a just general douche, then you don't get into the third layer of heaven. You just get to the second one. You just go to terrestrial heaven. In this heaven, you get to be close to Jesus, but not to God. Because he's only up there with the VIPs in celestial heaven. So, you know, you get to be close to Jesus, but not to God. And then, yeah. Then there is telestial heaven, which is so stupid, I didn't even make a slide for it. It's essentially where everybody else goes. And as I stated, they don't really have a hell. They have a spirit prison because that's somehow dumber than the idea of hell. And you go to this spirit prison until Jesus comes back. And when he comes back and he reigns on earth for a thousand years, you do a thousand year sentence in spirit prison. And then you get out. And you go to the third layer of heaven, which is still totally awesome, they love to point out. It's just not as awesome as the other two layers. That That's what these people believe. We, we're not even going to get into the fact that, you know, up until 1978, black people could not be clergies in their church because reasons. And those reasons were that dark skin equals bad in the Mormon faith. But in 1978, they totally reversed course and would love to point out to you that they're totally not racist. They just have a lot of racism in their teachings, but that they're totally not racist. Fuck the Mormons. Fuck Utah. Fuck Mitt Romney. Fuck that whole state. These people are a cult. But I think it, I think it's worth noting that, you know, they're a very successful cult. We, we, I mean, let, let, let's, you know, give credit where it's due, right? Them being super white and super racist helped them in their culthood. Because instead of just bringing the hammer down on these assholes, everybody just kept saying, eh, make them go over there, make them go over there. Until we shoved them into a desert state that nobody else wanted to live in. And they were like, fine, we'll live here. And we'll breed like rabbits. And, uh, you know, people were like, eh, they're white. Just, just keep them up there, ignore them. And then eventually they became a state. And now they have two senators that are basically in the pocket of the LDS church. And that should terrify everyone. People are like, oh, Mormons. No, fuck Mormons. Fuck them. They're, de they're, they're, they're weird. This is, this is not... I, I know that Christianity believes some insane shit, but come on. This stuff was made up like a hun just over a hundred years ago. This is not something that there's murky origins to. We know that this asshole made this up and everybody is just going along with it for some reason. I don't get it. The multiple wives thing, we're not even going to touch on that because, I mean, it, 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 it's just rudimentary math. They realized that they couldn't convert enough people to grow their religion because the shit they were saying was so batshit insane that no one would buy it. So they said, well, kids are stupid. Kids will believe anything. If we just have lots of kids and raise them in this insular fucking community where we tell them that all this nonsense is totally fucking believable, kids are dumb. They'll believe it. And then they'll have more kids and we'll just grow our community that way. They played the long game. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Christians are so oppressed. Go find me an atheist in Congress. Go find me an out-atheist in Congress. Someone who, from 
they're, you know, on the campaign trail will say, I don't believe in God. You won't find one. But go find me someone who says, I wear holy underwear. Well, there's two of them, at least, in Congress. Go find me a guy that's like, dark skin is bad. Well, that's like all of Congress. But yeah, the Mormons, it's a cult. You don't have to feel bad for making fun of it. Because it's a cult. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening to my rant. I hope it was coherent. Or at least somewhat. What kind of crazy people are you talking about? Crazy people in Utah. Hello, Dex. Dex is going to make an appearance as we say hello and goodbye. So thank you for being here. I appreciate you all very much. I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their Sunday. And uh, <laughs> thanks for listening to my rant. Try and find some peace today. And remember that Mormons are a cult and it's okay to make fun of them. If you took anything away from this, take away that you never have to feel bad about making fun of Mormons because they're definitely a cult. Bale said he likes your shirt. It's upside down. <laughs> it's not upside down, you silly boy. All right. Thanks for being here, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. We will be back next week with another Sunday sermon.